Hi, I'm Becca, and this is my husband, Gabe. That's me. Welcome to the podcast celebrating Jack Russell Terrier Dogs. And all the joys of companionship with canines of every kind. Each week, we'll explore all the heartfelt, humbling, and hilarious stories that only dog parents can truly relate to. We're Jack Russell Parents. Are you going to walk the dog looking like a cool youth pastor, or do you have a jogging suit? The suit's underneath my jean jacket for safekeeping. Mm, I see. Taking Carson for a walk in our neighborhood be like strolling through the mirror dimension. Oh, what? <laughs> sure. You never know who or how many dogs are going to drop into your timeline. For sure. And for today's episode, we are going on a multiverse adventure. First, we interview an amazing fellow dog podcaster. And then, believe it or not, folks, we hop over to her timeline. And for the first time ever, the Jack Russell parents, Becca and Gabe, will be interviewed. (laughs) It took a multidimensional journey to make that happen. (laughs) Yes, (laughs) it sure did. And I hope you all are as excited as we are. So let's web crawl right into it. Gracing the Jack Russell Parents timeline, we have with us today the amazing animal advocate and creator of the brilliant With a Dog podcast, Carly Parrish. Welcome, Carly. Thank you. Brilliant. That was that was very nice. That was a nice intro. Oh <laughs> uh, no, we we are a fan. We listen to your podcast. It's very enjoyable. Thank yeah. you for joining us. Oh well, thank you. We're like, she is a good interviewer. You want yeah. great follow up questions? Really, you we have a lot up. to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh oh my gosh. Well, thank you for saying that. I'm not going to lie. It, it took a little bit of time. As you guys know, you're like, I'm going to start a podcast. And then lo and behold, you're like, oh, wait, I actually have to try to lead a discussion and (laughs) ask questions and not just talk because I'm like, I'm great at talking. I'm going to start a podcast. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah, it's definitely something I had to learn for sure. Yeah, that's so cool. So when did you become a lover of all things dogs? I think that was probably in college for me. I'm originally from California, and then I went up to school in Portland and had a pretty hard time with seasonal depression and all of that. And I just felt really lost in my major and what do I want to do with my life and all of of the the angsty things that you go through. (laughs) And I went to a local animal shelter. I was volunteering there, like kind of walking around, and I was like, I want to do something here. I want to do something within this realm. I had my sister on the podcast like six months ago now, and she was teasing me because I went into college for like pre-med and and I liked dogs. We had a dog growing up, but I wasn't dog obsessed or anything. I didn't want to dedicate my life to animals. Yeah. Then all of a sudden I had this flip and I was coming home and I'm like, I'm going to be an animal advocate and I'm going to do this and all this. And everyone was like, where is this coming from? (laughs) We are originally from California as well. What area of California? Are you? I'm I'm from Sacramento because you guys are was it Sonoma? Yeah, Sonoma County. Yeah, yeah. So not not too far at all. <laughs> it's a small multiverse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys are in Texas now. Yeah, we are. Yeah, that was smart. Go go towards the sun. Keep, <laughs> yes, keep the sun. Now I'm up in Seattle and I'm like, why am I continuing to go north? Yeah. <laughs> So you have a heart for animal advocacy, and we understand for a time you were considering becoming an animal rights lawyer. Was there a moment or event that sparked your passion specifically for animal rights? I was volunteering still at the Oregon Humane Society, and they have an amazing investigative department, and that's where I was volunteering with. Working with the local animal control officers, Mm. processing cases as needed for, you know, anyone who had been doing any type of animal cruelty. And and so there was like a lawyer who I was working under. There's two animal law schools in the U.S. One, I think, is Vermont. Mm. Maybe it's New Hampshire. I want maybe Vermont. Anyway, (laughs) you can never tell the difference between those two places. (laughs) You can tell we're like West Coast people. Yeah, (laughs) I'm pretty sure it's Vermont. And then the other one is in Portland. And that's Lewis and Clark Law School. Oregon Humane Society at the time worked alongside Lewis and Clark. There was a lot of interns from the law school that would come and work at the shelter and things like that. And so I was just exposed to that Mm. and felt very connected to it. I was like, wow, that would just be so cool. And I saw I was attending like all these law conferences. And so that was probably when it sparked the interest. 
so I did a poli sci minor to tag along with my animal behavior. Okay. But then I realized like, oh, if I want to become an animal lawyer, I actually have to go to law school. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that's kind of when the ship sank a little bit. I spoke with enough people and enough lawyers who they more or less were like, do what you want. But there's some realities to the profession that I don't know if you would enjoy. Right. And I took that and was kind of like, yeah, I, th I think that makes sense. Yeah. Wow. That's really interesting. During that time, was is there a story that you can think of that really moved you or when you saw the work that the animal rights lawyers were doing really benefit an animal? Yeah. So at the time that I was there, the people that I was volunteering for were so amazing as far as how they coordinated all the cases. So they would take in a boarding case of 50 to 100 dogs from a wow. farm and mm -hmm. they would house them at the Oregon Humane Society. So that was like one person was kind of like project management for all of that. And another person was the lawyer who would put the case together. And that's what I assisted with was putting together these before and after pictures of a lot of dogs mm. once they were rehabilitated. And that was just absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it'll touch your heart for sure. Yeah, it was just really, really amazing to see the before and the after of all these dogs. And that's where you get the most satisfaction. Yeah. And, you know, a little bit of the whole you're putting together all this evidence against someone so you can bring them to justice for what they did. And <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, there's that. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so there wasn't a specific dog or anything, but I just remember going through all these before and after pictures and just feeling so amazed at the at the work that they were doing. You could see the joy in the dog's faces, I'm sure. Yes. One of the law school students that I was volunteering alongside, she was doing more of the law aspect of it. And she ended up adopting one of the dogs and one of the cats. So it was really cool to be able to kind of see them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that sounds like incredible work. So tell us now about how you developed a successful podcasting brand. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the shift. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. like, I'm over here like I'm going to be an animal lawyer. And then 10 years later, I'm like, I want to be an influencer. All valuable. It's all valuable. It's OK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The podcast came about, I say a lot that it was sparked when I had moved to London and I saw the dog community there. And then I also was really into podcasts at the time because I didn't know anyone. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was just constantly, you know, headphones in. It was nice to listen to podcasts because I felt like I had friends. If yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> sure. Especially, yeah, <laughs> especially the podcasts that have co-hosts. It was just like nice banter and I was laughing and I would go through the day without speaking to anyone besides my husband. But I, I would say it almost like the idea of exposing people to the animal world probably even came before London. I was just thinking about this the other day because I remember being at an animal shelter. So this is when we were in Seattle before we moved to London. And at the animal shelter, I remember wanting to attach a GoPro to my hat and do a vlog of animal shelter life, a day in the life of working with these dogs and cats. I feel like the idea was started there. Yeah. And then it kind of just snowballed from there. I moved to London. We had our dog Lupin. He came with us and I wanted to start some kind of expat in London blog. And, and that's where the name with a dog came along. For a while, my Instagram handle was either like Carly with a dog or Carly and a dog. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of just like this idea of like living your life with a dog. Perfect. I started it. I did like one blog post and I hated writing it. And <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> We've been there. Yeah, definitely like to talk more. Yeah, so then I was just doing the Instagram, you know, taking photos just to document my time there and enjoying it and still working within the animal world. I got Lupin when I was 23 and so at this point he had had multiple medical issues, mm. a lot of behavioral issues too. I had worked in an animal shelter, I worked at a vet office, I'd worked at a dog food company, and I was like, wow, I feel like I have a lot of knowledge about dog mom life or dog world things yeah yeah but i'm not i'm not a trainer or i'm not a behaviorist or a vet or a vet tech or you know anything like that i'm just still dog mom carly yeah but i have all of this knowledge so this is back in like 2017 2018 there weren't many dog podcasts out there or the ones that were out there weren't quite fitting what i wanted you know a lot of them were specifically from the angle of a vet 
or from a trainer, mm. which is totally fine. Right. But I was like, I want someone to talk about how their dog barfed in the middle of the night last night. And, <laughs> you know, now they're tired because they have no sleep and huh. but the dog's fine. Yes. And, you know, like things Real like, life. like, I'm like, I want to commiserate. <laughs> and yeah. And plus, you know, if I can also pass on information to people from credible sources, then, you know, you're on your work commute, you can easily toss on the podcast, laugh a little about this thing, life with a dog. And that was the idea behind it. And also, I wanted to create this community of dog parents, too. So then in 2020, when I had moved back to Seattle by then, so three years later, then I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. That's awesome. And I feel like and I know we'll talk about it here in a little bit ourselves about our podcasting journey or why we got into it. But I feel like we're kindred spirits yes, absolutely. in what you just described. Exactly. So yeah. I think that's really <laughs> <Yeah>. cool. <laughs> we want to talk about dogs, but we're not trainers. So we'll be careful not to say that we're trainers or behaviorists right. or dog experts. We just love on dogs. So we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Speaking of loving on dogs, your precious pups, Lupin and Albus, how did they come into your life? Oh, my goodness. Loopy. <laughs> yeah, Loopy and Alby is their nicknames. <laughs> Great. As I said, I was 23, out of college for like a year. I just moved in with my now husband. We were living in Seattle and I was working at a vet office at the time. And I saw his rescue story. So I was still very much in the animal advocacy world and, and you know, still keeping my eye on like animal law, thinking along those lines still. Mm -hmm. And I saw that there was this hoarding case and a bunch of dogs were rescued from it. So it was a, an American Foxhound breeder who fell on hard times. There was a flood. You know, there was all these stories. Mm -hmm. But basically, the dogs had gotten a bit basically interbred <laughs> so much above like all these dogs that she had that there became 72 of them oh yeah in this like dog run situation that she had yeah and so wow, wow. Oh, gosh. from my understanding you know either she was reported or something and then she did hand over all of the dogs or most of them or mm -hmm. so they were handed over but they were very much like on a farm they had had very little human interaction oh wow you know i, I saw these dogs and i was like oh my god they're beautiful like i, I need one and <laughs> yeah and i'm just like oh you know i didn't care about the purebred thing or whatever i was just i fell in love like immediately it was one of those things that you yeah. just know <laughs> okay that's how i was gonna ask you see that face and you know that belongs sure to face. you yeah. yes yeah exactly Exactly. And it was hard because there were, as I said, 72 of them in the hoarding case, but there were 12 at the rescue that I went to. So, you know, I was like, which one are they going to give me? You know, they're all beautiful, but, you know, and they all look the same basically too. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, he was the one we ended up getting and definitely a project at the beginning as far as his behavior, not in the, the regular dog ways, but just that he was so fearful and shy of everything as i said you know he hadn't really um interacted with any human things before oh yeah so fortunately he loved his crate so he would just go in there and sit in there and just watch us and then the the couch got to him he was like oh that looks very comfy so he eventually came out on the couch and, and <laughs> laid there but you know we'd have to like sit on the other side of the couch he, if, if you sat too close to him, he'd like get up and go to the crate. Aww. Then he saw the bed and was like, that looks even more comfy. And so, <laughs> and so he, he eventually worked his way around the apartment over the course of like a few months. And then after that, it was just kind of managing him as far as what he was afraid of and what he wasn't and just continuously desensitizing him. Mm -hmm. He's definitely the hardest dog we will probably ever have, I think, as far as just between behavior and medical. Aww. But it's also really good that that happened, I think, so early because you know, we we realized we were able to handle all of these things that cropped up. Yeah. That leads me to Albus. We got him May of 2020. So he's coming up on two years with us. And he is just a typical dog. Easy, <laughs> basically. <laughs> He's just so easy in comparison to Loopy. <laughs> yeah, so it was kind of just one of those things. We moved back from London. Mm. Lupin was 10-ish at the time. And we were like, we should get a dog now. If we want a second dog, we should get one now. Oh, okay. Albie was, we think, like four or five when we adopted him. And Lupin was also like three or four when we adopted him. Yeah, so we haven't had a puppy mm -hmm. yet, and that's been purposeful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's not that's a bad a thing. That's a whole different journey. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. We're like, we went through a lot with Loopy. Let's get a dog that's probably going to be okay with kids and okay with strangers and wants affection and all of those quote unquote regular dog things. Yeah. And yeah, Albie was the first one we looked at. I, I wanted a hound specifically, which is kind of hard to get in the Pacific Northwest. First dog we looked at and it was like, oh, dang, he's he's exactly what we want. Like, like we thought this would be like a six month search or something. Perfect. He's fit perfectly into the family. He's just so loving, so sweet, still fairly independent, which is nice because I personally don't want those type of dogs that just like want to be by your side constantly. That's, which is why I like hounds, because they do have a, an element of independence to them. <laughs> so now here we are. And of course, now I'm like, I want a third. <laughs> but, but I won't. I won't. I'm going to hold off. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to end up in someone's file somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, no hoarding. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to see my previous co-workers like, Carly, <laughs> they're going to show up at the door one day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happened? You've fallen so far. <laughs> Now that we've learned about Loopy and Albie, which I just love the names. <laughs> so what do you love most about being a puppy parent? I feel like that's actually a very hard question because there's an, a lot not to like when you actually look at the day to day life. Sure. We we just went on vacation with some friends of ours from college and they're very similar to us as far as their interests and what they like to do, but they don't have any dogs. Mm. And it's just so funny because they talk about their life and they're like, oh yeah. And then on the weekends we go to this coffee shop and then we just stay there for hours. It kind of turns you into a brewery at the end of the day. And and I'm just sitting there thinking like, oh, my God, my dogs are such a time suck. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would do are. these things if I had the yeah. chance. <laughs> Every time we do something, the first question is, when does Carson have to potty? And yes. Like, okay, that yeah. determines our life. How long we can be gone. <laughs> yeah, all of it. You know, I, I'm going to be the first to say it, even though I have a dog podcast and I'm fully, you know, neck deep in this dog stuff. There's a lot of negatives to having a dog. But I think for me, what I love the most about it is I get so much satisfaction out of their happiness, especially Loopy. Yeah. He's old now. He's in his retirement. And <laughs> and it just it's so nice to see him happy and knowing that he's lived such a good life with us. And then same thing with Albie, we think was like a ranch dog from Texas. He and he got shipped up to Pacific Northwest. I think he actually really loved the ranch. I don't think he was badly treated or anything like that there. Yeah. <laughs> and so sometimes Good. I feel bad for him because he's like, I just want to sit out in the sun, but it's raining. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at those moments that he is just so happy playing with his toys or jumping up on the bed and being like, hello, like in the morning is just <laughs> that makes my heart really happy. So I think that's probably what I would love the most about it. What is in store for the With a Dog universe this year and beyond? Oh my goodness. So <laughs> <laughs> this year is a transformative year for me with the podcast and it, it's a little bit of like a level up time. So cool. yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I didn't cover this earlier, but like for anyone who doesn't know, I started out the podcast with a co-host. She was someone I had worked at the shelter with before I moved to London and she was amazing still friends with her and stuff but she decided that she just wanted to take her career in a different direction and and couldn't spend as much time on the podcast she had gotten a promotion at work and really wanted to put all her efforts towards that which is totally fine so that was year one and then year two this whole last year was me trying to really figure out what i wanted from the podcast as far as yeah. because it's just mine now mm -hmm. and that was a lot of reflection, a lot of weeks of being me scrambling like, oh, God, you know, I need to get a guest on. And yeah, <laughs> it was I, I kind of took a beat. And at the same time, I also did a rebrand. Mm -hmm. Same thing to kind of just like take ownership and be like, OK, these are this is a brand that I think reflects what I want out of the podcast. And I saw that happen. I saw that happen in Lifetime on Instagram. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it was called the new logo. I love it. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, it was really nice. I'm also, and you know, maybe this is uh, me being a little woo-woo or whatnot, <laughs> millennial with her astrology signs, but I'm also a Libra, <laughs> which is extremely indecisive. Okay. <laughs> and that is very much me, <laughs> Libra or not. I'm just extremely indecisive. So I tried to outsource a few of those kind of things. I wanted someone to just tell me this looks good. Mm. Do you like it? And then me to be like, yes. And then they're like, great. This is how you use the colors. This is how you mm. do all that. That was last year. And we're actually coming up on the two year anniversary. Yay. I'm super excited about that. Yeah, I bet. That's going to kick off making it, I don't want to say into a business, but a little bit more of like an actual community, an actual brand. Sure. Getting some merch sorted and. I'm going to be bringing on new segment. It's a once a month co-host. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super excited for that just to be able to interface mm -hmm. with more people on the <laughs> podcast that aren't just guests that I'm interviewing. That's great. We look forward to seeing how that unfolds. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope you guys like it. And I'm super excited to, to get the ball rolling on that. Really, the whole aspect of it is just trying to make it more of a community. So I'm going to have like a little membership thing where we do like virtual get togethers more often and just more of a community feel with all my listeners because a lot of them already talk to each other anyway, or we're DMing together, you know, already. And so it'd be really nice to just do something virtually regularly. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's my hope. So we'll, we'll see. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. And we're looking forward to seeing that come to fruition and seeing maybe how we can get involved. So that's wonderful. So now, Carly, on to our Zoomy round of interview questions. Okay. For you, coffee shop coffee or homemade coffee? Oh, man. Homemade coffee. I got an espresso machine for my birthday this last year. Oh, so wait. So homemade espresso specifically. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful. So what's the best part about living in the Pacific Northwest? Oh, gosh. You got to pick something. <laughs> Is there a best part? We're, yeah, we're like in the height of winter. Yeah. I love Seattle as a city as far as the, the people and the things to do. It's such a foodie area between Seattle and Portland. And there's a local wine area. I feel like it really just has it all except the sun. <laughs> when the sun is out, it is absolutely beautiful. I just love the springs and summers up here. Fantastic. So what are your dog's best tricks? Oh, gosh. Lupin, Lupin cannot figure out a command to save his life. Well, he that's okay. We just... will forgive him for that. <laughs> it took us three years to teach him how to sit. Part of that was because he was so scared, like you couldn't touch him to like put him into a sit. But part of that was just, he just gives you this blank stare. Yeah. And you, you just, like, there's <laughs> all this, he's very smart when he wants to be, but he does not want to be a lot of the times. So his trick is probably just tricking us into giving him food constantly. <laughs> nice. he's, you know, he'll just stand there until we give him a treat. And he's 80 pounds, so you can't really force him <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> And now he's 80 pounds and rickety on his old legs. So. Oh, <laughs> right. Oh, <no. laughs> sweet guy. He just tricks us into doing whatever. We He'll add an extra limp. He's like, oh. A little bit. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but no, he knows like sit and lay down and, and stuff like that. And then Albie is learning middle and it's been very good. So that's like where he either stands or sits between my legs when I'm standing up. Aww. So if we're standing in line somewhere. Nice. It's really nice because if you just put him in a middle, then he's contained. That's great. I don't have to worry about him like sniffing into someone's purse <laughs> or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're still working on it. It's a little hit or miss. Yeah. Sounds great. Do you have a favorite radio station or Sirius XM station? I don't actually know the exact numbers, I think, because they're just saved on my car. Uh, <laughs> I listen to country music. Cool. Yeah, so that's my fave. But otherwise, it's like top 40. Great. We talked a little bit about Jane Austen earlier, but what Jane Austen character do you relate to most and why? Uh, you know, as much as I want to be over here, be like, I'm Elizabeth Bennet and I'm so smart and I'm so above <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the, the craziness of the world and Mr. Darcy's going to fall in love with me. Right. Yeah. I'm probably more like Emma. <laughs> where I'm just like in, in people's business. And <laughs> <I'm> like, 
gossiping and stuff. Let me interview you and then push it out to the world. Yeah, 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 exactly. You're in a good career. Yeah, this is good. (laughs) Side question, which Marvel character do you relate to most? Oh, dang. Ooh. I mean, there's so many great, especially female Marvel characters. I really like, and of course, now I'm blanking on her name. It's Natasha's sister in Black Widow. Ah, yeah. I loved her. Like, she was just calling people out. Yeah. Calling Natasha out. Like, why are you posing like that? What are you doing? And then she was badass, too. So. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, she So I I really liked her. I want to be sassy and kick people in the face. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of entertainment, what's your on in the background just for noise TV show? Probably like Modern Family. Or something. Yeah. I love a 30 minute sitcom. Me too. And and that's the one I grew up on. That or Psych. Yeah. Psych is great. Yes. I think that's is... one of the most underrated shows ever. It is. Mm-hmm. It's so yeah. witty. Yeah. Sometimes it'll be a criminal minds, but <laughs> yeah. which is obviously not light and easy, but <laughs> also somehow a comfort show. <laughs> So our final Zoomy Sewed question, as a human, what is your favorite high value treat? Oh, dang. Besides espresso. Yeah. Well, this is espresso related, (laughs) but tiramisu. Ah, Nice. Yes. Something about the last five years. Every time I see it, I'm like, I need to buy it. I need that (laughs) treat. Yeah. (laughs) It is a more grown up dessert. It's a fancy bread pudding for us Southerners. Exactly. Yes. Well, awesome. So that does it for us. So thank you so much, Carly, for joining us on the Jack Russell Parents Universe. It was a pleasure and an honor. Well, thank you guys. Those those Zoomy questions at the end, those were spot on. I loved those. Those were good. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you guys so much for, for having me and interviewing me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next multiverse. I can interview you. Yes. <laughs> so how about we travel through the time and space portal into the with a dog dimension? You can't see me, but I'm spinning my hands like Doctor Strange right now. <laughs> it's happening. I'm Here we go. Effect. We're going to step right through. Okay. <laughs> Yep. All right. Here, here we are. You've arrived. We're here. It's awesome here. <laughs> the with a dog dimension. I feel like this is kind of Marvel-esque, but also a little Doctor Who-esque. Like <laughs> right. I, I just pictured you guys getting in like a TARDIS or something. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, awesome. So we've got Becca and Gabe of the Jack Russell Parents podcast. How are you guys? Hi. Oh, wonderful. We're having a great time. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so excited to be flipping it on you. And you said earlier, I think, is this the first time you've been interviewed on a podcast? It is. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. we're approaching 100 podcasts and we've never been interviewed. So this is quite a treat. We'll see how we do. I am so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's sometimes it's really hard to be the one interviewed because you're so used to directing the conversation. And then all of a sudden you have to like release the reins. Right. And then you're coughing and you're like oh my god i hope they take that out and i hope (laughs) that sounded stupid afterwards (laughs) so yeah i'm sure you'll do great don't worry about it just for all the listeners could you guys briefly introduce yourself and your dog yeah so i'm becca and i'm gabe and we live near austin texas deep in the heart of texas and we are the host of jack russell parents podcast And briefly, our podcast, like we talked about earlier, Carly, we celebrate Jack Russell Terrier dogs, of course, because that's what we have and love. But we also celebrate the joys of companionship with dogs of all kinds. And I feel like we truly are an entertainment show. Mm -hmm. But we also like to bring you interviews with trainers and dog parenting tips from experts. And we also, and this may be my most favorite thing that we do we like to celebrate creators of dog content or products so like dog book authors producers of tv shows we did dogs in space on netflix and like animal photographers and things like that i think that just kind of lends to our we've met some very successful people and it's been really awesome yeah. And speaking of our dog, uh, our Jack Russell Terrier pup's name is, well, his full name is Sir Carson, the Duke of Itchingham. <laughs> but he mostly goes by Carson. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. 
<laughs> they need a full name. Yes. They yes. always need a full name and the nickname. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, thank you guys. I love what you were saying about the podcast as far as it being like an entertainment show. I think you guys, yeah. that's something that you guys do really, really well. And I love listening. Well, thank you. Yeah. To, yeah. To that entertainment part specifically. I enjoy listening to other podcasts, not necessarily only in the dog space, but just in general, because I think everyone does something slightly different. And it's always fun to try to bring in that different creativity, like you were saying, interviewing specifically people who are producing some kind of like creative dog content yeah. in the world. It's really cool because I don't know that there's that many podcasts or people just in general highlighting those people, Yeah, you know, in that specific way that you guys do. So I think that's a really good angle to take. Thank and you. Thank you. And I think that kind of stems from our creative life, right? So we always appreciate it when someone enjoyed something that we created, right? Mm -hmm. Or that we got that support. So we just want to give that back. Yeah. Give people an opportunity to celebrate them. Yes. There's another podcast that I interviewed a while ago and collaborating with, and that was the Iggy Parents podcast. And they were similar as far as that they were in the creative world. Yeah. And they were both theater actors. And mm, yeah, we love the Iggy parents. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You guys know them. Yeah. And so it was just really fun because they did have that creative aspect that honestly, sometimes I can get too granular, like interviewing <laughs> the guest of like, this is informational and the people yeah. need to know this. And, and, but it's sometimes it's really nice to take a little from other podcasts and be like, yeah, they're really creative with how they entertain. And that's so cool. So yeah, I think that you guys do such a good job with that. Thank you. Well, let's do a quick dog parent check-in before we talk purely about Carson, <laughs> since it's all about him. Of course <laughs> it is. So how are you guys? How is life? What have you been up to lately? Well, we're really blessed in this time of our life, but we are trying to find more margin. <laughs> if you've heard <laughs> Forcing that margin. phrase before. <laughs> we just feel like we need more margin to just be. Be together as well as be with Carson. Mm. We both work full-time jobs in addition to our bi-weekly podcast. Yeah. And so it just kind of adds up, you know. It's like that cliche, we want to be human beings, not human doings. Yeah. Ooh, I haven't heard that before. I like that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We got, we, we're doing a lot and we want to just be for a, for a minute. It helps that the, the weather is getting better here in Texas. We live near some wooded areas and Carson loves going on walks. That's his favorite thing in the whole world. So giving him more of that has yeah. been nice. And, and I would also say that currently we're also focused a little bit more on our health. We just started Lint and we're a week and a half in and we're taking a break from sweets. And so... We're already feeling a little healthier. Good. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> nice. <laughs> yeah. I'm a straight up sugar addict. It's really bad. Along those same lines, we're making some healthier choices for Carson too. We joke, but we have his skinny butt food. <laughs> to weight help management. Him, yes. Help him slim down a bit. And then we're giving him probiotics. He started taking these calming chews. But he's looking good and feeling good too. So we're all on the right path right now, I think. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so good. I was just about to say, I woke up this morning and was like, okay, going to jump on with the Jack Russell parents. And I am so sore from a workout that uh -huh. I've been doing the last good few days. You. I had to take a few Advil. I was like, oh my God. I was like, I need to drink some coffee, take some Advil so I can actually be ready yeah. for this. Otherwise, I'm going to be sitting here just like in pain. Thanks for powering through it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it's it's true. It's one of those things of you just got to do it mm -hmm. as far as the health. And that's very hard. I, I've been struggling with that recently. So that's very impressive that you guys are, are doing it. And for Carson, too. Carson's probably like, I didn't sign up for Lent. Like, yeah, exactly. I didn't give up <laughs> treats for Lent. I don't know what the heck uh. this is about. <laughs> oh. I like all of those. I feel like I resonate oh, gosh. really for with what you guys have been up to as far as human beings and just being a little bit more present and enjoying life. Yeah. yeah. I think as over the last two years, there's been a lot less of that for sure. And a lot more of the yeah, eating the sweets absolutely. And, and everything. I can speak for myself, at least. <laughs> Some <laughs> yes. people have been amazing. And it's they're true. like, you know, I learned a new language, you know, from 2020 on and <laughs> I lost so much weight. And I'm like, I did the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I, I kept little Debbie in business. That's what I did. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, I look forward to hearing how you guys feel after the 40 days. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see if it's been like a drastic life change or anything like that. Yeah. So that's what you've been up to. And you said you live outside Austin, right? Yeah, it's technically the hill country. So there's rolling hills. There's a lot of wooded areas that haven't been developed yet. It's not good for allergies, but it's good for we get a sense of the wilderness without being too far away from decent restaurants. Yes, that is very nice. Those friends that I was talking about earlier when you interviewed me, that they live in Austin. Oh, great. And they're initially from Portland, but they're down there for work. And we visited them a year ago and... I loved Austin. It's a cool place. Yeah. I was so amazed. Now that I know that you're down there, I'm like, well, maybe I'll like take a podcast trip down there. We can see each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We would love that. That'd be fun. Yeah. It was so dog friendly and oh, yeah. it was beautiful too. You know, got the river going through and the, mm. the trees and I, it was very green. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for a city, it's a very green, which yeah. is not what you expect. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. The food was just amazing. I'm such a foodie. So that's great. It was, yeah, I'm, I'm a little jealous of you guys. As much <laughs> as I love Pacific Northwest and Seattle also has the food and it's also very green, it's different. Yeah. And also, can I just say, everyone down there was so good looking. <laughs> I I was shocked. I mean, of course, I was like right in the downtown city, which, yeah. which is where, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of like young, newly graduated college people that are attractive, but still. But, I, like, you know. <laughs> Was like, you know, what now is that you mentioned it, I guess that that's true. I don't know that I really thought about it until right now, but there, yeah. There you go. Well, that's good. I'm just used to the Seattle people who were not to say that they're not good looking, but everyone's <laughs> pale and everyone's in Patagonia. And you know, it's, it's, a, different, <laughs> it's yeah. a different look. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love it. It's very Twilight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, that's Austin. That's you guys. Let's talk about Carson. Yes. Let. <laughs> <laughs> so going to be like a rapid answer round. Okay. Sounds good. Similar to your Zoomies, just a little bit more info about him. So I feel like this first question is pretty obvious. His breed. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, he's a Parson Russell Terrier due to his long legs. But the Jack Russell Terrier name is kind of like a catch all for the breed itself. Yeah. So he is a Jack Russell, but a Parson. Tell what's the what's the difference then? This is supposed to be a rapid answer, but now I'm curious. So Parson is taller. Yeah, yeah, he's taller. He has longer legs. So it stemmed from when they were being bred for fox hunting. So the shorter leg ones can get into the holes better once they've caught the fox. The longer leg ones can keep up with the bigger dogs mm. when they're chasing. So that's part of how it was bred. And then it's just really the people that did the breeding trying to preserve that legacy. It really came down to the look that they preferred. Interesting. Okay. I honestly, I am woefully uneducated about Jack Russell Terriers, <laughs> which is why I'm so excited to have you guys on. I did not know that they were fox hunters. I thought terriers were all like mm-hmm. rat hunters. I, I don't know what I was like. I just, <laughs> I think maybe I knew someone. Well, well, they'll hunt those too. Okay. They'll hunt anything. They'll hunt any rodent. He, or he's the small sweetest animal. dog until he sees something that's furry, small, and not a dog. A switch flips and there's no calming them down. It. Yeah. Interesting. Oh my gosh. So our dogs would probably have worked alongside. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. My fox hound, Lupin would sniff the fox out and then probably just stop right there. And then, <laughs> yeah, and like, then Carson can come in and be like, dive into the hole. Yeah. And be like, I'm going to get you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting off your rhythm here, but. My parents have a little Jack Russell, too, and she'll just – they have an acre of land, and she just goes out there, and she hunts lizards. Like, All the time. in a pile of wood. She'll stare at that pile of wood until she sees a lizard, and then she'll go after it. It's hilarious. It's just so cool, like, what they were bred for and what their interests are. As I said, Lupin will scent something out. Yeah. From, you know, he will find that crumb from like 200 yards away somehow. He'll drag us to it. <laughs> and I'm like, there, it's a half a cracker in a bush. Like, how did you find this? <laughs> like, he would drag yeah. us into it. And that's fantastic. But it's like, he can't see it though, like the Jack Russell could. He scents it all, but he would never like actually sight, mm-hmm. like have it in his sights ever. Gotcha. And so I think that's that's why it's just like so interesting. Okay. Anyway, back into it. We'll, we'll talk about Jack Russell's more. So Carson's age. He just turned seven in February. Oh, my goodness. Like how old is he when you got him? He was a baby. Eight or nine weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
He was a little one. Okay. So you've had him for seven years now. Yeah. Oh my goodness. He's just now starting to calm down. Where most dogs, this is like their their retirement years. They're heading into that. Mm -hmm. He's getting the maturity to where we can really start to work with him and train him. It only took seven years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. He should get a good 17 years out of life. So that's what we're hoping. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's good for you guys. Okay. What's his favorite food? People food. <laughs> He loves rotisserie chicken. He does love oh rotisserie gosh. chicken. And peanut butter. Those are his favorite. Yeah. It's all in moderation. Yeah. He's got good taste. Who doesn't love a rotisserie chicken? I know. it. And he licks his lips every time you say, would you like some peanut butter? And he licks his lips. It's hilarious. Cute. <laughs> what is his favorite toy? Currently. <laughs> yeah. Does it change a lot then? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Normally, the newest one is yeah. the favorite. Uh, He's like a toddler. You know, after 10 minutes, it's just an explosion of toys in the house. <laughs> He'll play with one and then 30 seconds later. But technically, I think his favorite toys is what we call Franken toys, where he'll get pieces of other toys he destroyed. We tie them together and throw them. And he loves that game. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Or if there's a hole in one and you can shove a toy in it and then and he it, works to get it out. Yeah, take it apart that. like a puzzle. He loves that. That sounds so cute. I think it'd be really fun to watch that. <laughs> I always like these questions. You know, I think everyone's like, oh, yeah, dog likes treats. Dog likes human food. Dog likes toys. But every dog does have their little idiosyncrasies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some dogs are just like they have a favorite toy that they just carry around with them mm -hmm. every day. And it's like their comfort toy that they <laughs> have for years. Sounds like Carson is like whatever is the coolest and the newest. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's so unique. Is he a beach or a mountains dog? I would say mountains. We've never been to the beach. With him. He's not a huge fan of water. Yeah. Has he been to like any water, like a lake or something? Yeah, to like a creek and he he barely goes in. He'll like touch it and he'll be like, ew, it's wet. Let's yeah. not. <laughs> he doesn't care for water. My dogs are the same. Okay, he's a mountains dog. Well, that works. You guys are in hill country. Yeah. Is he a people lover or a dog lover? People. Absolutely people. Yeah. Yeah. He'll play with other people at the dog park when we take him to the dog resort when we're traveling. He's only playing and interacting with the mm -hmm. humans. <laughs> Yeah. And like, because they have cameras and you can see him. He does this. And he does that. You could see him in the video doing that to this poor person who's trying to watch all these dogs. And he's like, pay attention to me. I feel like that's definitely a, a breed trait. Yeah. As far as any other Jack Russell Terriers I've met, I definitely think that they tend to enjoy people more than playing with other dogs. Absolutely. Yeah. Is he clingy or independent? I kind of want to say both, but I would lean towards clingy, mm -hmm. at least to me. Yeah. <laughs> He's clingy <laughs> to me. Okay. He yeah. does follow me from room to room, but, yeah. you know. He follows me too, but he's more of supervising, like making yeah. sure that I'm doing what's <laughs> sure. acceptable in his mind. <laughs> You're going towards the peanut butter jar. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds like it tracks for the terriers I've met. It seems like they're clingy, but not in a way that's like, I need to be on top of you. Right. But just like in a, I'm going to watch what you're doing. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, he's always watching. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I really like about terriers and just certain breeds is like they're just so very alert. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lupin is not whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> when he was younger, I think he was very alert because he was constantly scared of things. But at some point, he just dropped that. And now he's just, I don't know, he's in his own little head. He's just daydreaming away. But Albie is very alert. So that was the rapid answer round about all about Carson. We're going to keep talking about him. I'd love to hear his, how he came into your life story and how you decided that you wanted a Parsons Terrier. Well, seven years ago, we had been married for probably about two or three years at that point. Um, anyway, we were having infertility issues. And so we were kind of at a point where we just wanted something to happen in our life. And so we were like, 
I think it was Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Something's got to give. What are we going to do? We talked about like three options, buying a dog, trying to find, trying to buy a house in California (laughs) or (laughs) Or (laughs) going going on a trip to Europe or something. Yeah. And in hindsight, maybe we should have took the trip to Europe first, but (laughs) like there's, there's very different stakes. Yeah. Trip to Europe. It's like, okay, that's a couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> a dog, you know, as I is it like 17 years. A house, yeah. you know, 30 year mortgage. And <laughs> right. yeah. uh, maybe we should have come up with some more comparable options, but we went with a dog. We've both grew up with Jack Russells or Terriers of some sort in our lives. I've just always loved them. I just love their little personalities. And so that's why I wanted to get a Jack Russell. So you were like, we need a change in our life. We need to shake it up in some way is what it sounds like. Yes. Yeah. And so you both knew that you had liked Jack Russell Terriers or, or had experienced them previously in your life. Absolutely. Was that something like when you guys were dating? Did it like attract you to each other or anything? Like, oh, he likes the same dogs as me or anything like that? Well, yeah. It certainly helped. I had a Jack Russell growing up. We got him probably in middle school. And by the time I met Becca, he was about 16, right? So he was well, you know, he was into his very deep retirement years. Mm -hmm. Spending, We're spending more time together. She's now coming over to the house and he just fell in love with her. Mm -hmm. And and I I really feel that he held on longer because he just had so much love for for Becca. Oh. He became my dog. He be, yeah, he <laughs> followed her around and her uh, exclusively. And it was like none of us <laughs> none of us were in the room <laughs> that have known him for 16 years. It was just it was the most adorable thing. And then of course he passed because he was just mm-hmm. so well on in years. And it was devastating for us. We talked about him every day for months and months, probably years, and then until we finally decided to get another Jack Russell. Oh, that's so special. Yeah. I love that. That's really, that's a really sweet story. I think, as you said, it's like sometimes you just, I want the dog that I grew up with or whatever. But the fact that you both were able to experience this dog and the love. What was his name again? Wiggles. Wiggles. Stop. (laughs) That's cute. That's a good name. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And of course, Gabe, you were probably like, I have to marry her now. Wiggles said so. Like, yeah. Wiggles, you know, I can't uh-huh. betray the legacy of Wiggles. Well, another funny story. When we came back from our honeymoon, he completely shunned her. <gasps> he was he all, what have tell, you done? Yeah, what have you done? You betrayed me. <laughs> He's like... Yeah, I thought we were getting married. (laughs) It took a few days for him to come around and start following her again, but he was giving her the cold shoulder for sure. Oh my God. Was he in the wedding at all? No. Maybe no, that was it. Yeah, he, he, he was like, I thought I was going to be the ring bearer or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what the problem was. Yeah. He was <laughs> yeah. like, he I really should have been the star of the show. I don't know why <laughs> it didn't happen. Oh my God. That's so sweet that Wiggles was able to, to have like an important role in your guys' relationship, even though it was originally your family dog game. <laughs> yeah. So sweet. yeah. Sweet. It's fine. Sweet guy. I'm, I'm happy that he was happy at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy he finally found his soulmate in Becca. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Wiggles inspired a few years later. We were like, all right, Carson, it's time for Carson. Mm-hmm. And so how'd you come upon Carson? Did you find a breeder or? Yeah, I just Googled, yeah, Jack Russell Terrier yeah. breeders. And, you know, I wanted to look for the responsible, caring ones. And yeah. so that was a bit of a search. And it's, it's a shame that people that, you know, they hoard and they abuse animals. And it, it really gives a bad name to people who care about the legacy of a breed and preserving mm-hmm. it and, and caring for animals and giving them to loving homes. Mm-hmm. And she was really great, this breeder, because... She obviously knew Jack Russell's very well because she said, here he is. And if it doesn't work out, like if at any point you can't handle it, bring him back to me. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That I think that is, you know, one of the like green flags yeah. with a responsible breeder. Yes. They would always want their dog back mm-hmm. no matter the age or anything because mm-hmm. they feel responsible for bringing that dog into the world. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. We were sitting in the car on a Valentine's weekend and I just handed her my phone. And it's like, okay, here are their pictures. They were just born. They were so They were cute. like two days old, the pictures. Oh. And here, let's choose one. Mm-hmm. And so how did you choose amongst all of them? 
Oh, I, oh God, I don't even know. Like, he was just so cute. <laughs> I, I mean, they were so young, really. Yeah. So I guess yeah. maybe it was really more just based on markings or I think so. just a feeling. He had the brown know. mask, just like Wiggles. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I think that's such a good story. It wasn't just like, we want a dog. It was like, <laughs> here's our three options. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good origin story for yeah, Carson, for yeah. sure, and how Wiggles ties in, too. So now that you have had Carson for seven years, and as you said, he's finally slowing down <laughs> to the point that he's just mature and a little bit more calm, not to, quite to his retirement years, as you said. Mm -hmm. What is it about Jack Russell Terriers that you guys love so much? Well, the tagline for our podcast is more than a dog, almost a person, so much to love. Mm -hmm. And our pup for us is more than a dog. As we said, he's our baby. We still haven't conceived. So he's the closest thing. He's filling in the void as best he can. Yeah. Say the tagline one more time. More than a dog. Almost a person. So much to love. So much to love. <laughs> oh, that's sweet. I like that a lot. I think that's a good tagline. Because I think you can kind of twist it in different ways of almost a person, a member of the family, but also not a person. Right. Just such an integral part of your life and a member mm -hmm. of the family, but not jumping that leap. You know, there's quite a few people out there that are maybe a little over the top. We don't almost <laughs> almost. Yeah, we don't yes. personify him in an unhealthy yes, way. He is a dog. <laughs> yes, exactly. He, he is still a dog. He still tries to go chase the squirrels. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And 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 I think we think of him as almost a person, really referring to how super intelligent Jack Russells are. It's really what I love about him the most. You know, is how how smart they are. And like we talked about before, they're watching you. His little wheels are always turning. He's frankly a little conniving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that they bring a lot of life and a lot of fun and adventure to having him and he's so stinking cute i mean he's just adorable i can't even... i have not had a small breed dog in my life but the ones i've been exposed to have so much personality yeah as much as i love my big boys i love loopy and i'll be but i don't think they have the extent of that personality that a lot of yeah. small dogs do especially those really smart mm -hmm. small yeah. dogs as you said, they're just so smart and they really are like problem solvers, it seems like. Oh, yes. yeah. We cannot trick him. I, we have to use reverse psychology. We have to use code words. Like, <laughs> yeah. And he knows when we're talking about him. He'll look at us one to the other, one to the other. And he knows that we're trying to trick him into a bath or <laughs> trying to you know, get into the other room to you know without record him. a podcast <laughs> without him in there. <laughs> It's like living in Jurassic Park. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, I think that's one of the coolest things about the Jack Russell Terriers that I'm aware of is just, as you said, how absolutely alert they are mm -hmm. and also just smart. And I'm one of those people that I'm like, I get very nervous if I feel like my dog is smarter than me. <laughs> and I feel I feel like maybe they would be like, <laughs> maybe that's the reason I stick to my hounds yeah it they, feels they're like smart that. when they want to be yeah. but not to that extent for sure so how did carson and jack russell terrier life inspire the podcast well we were thinking about what is it that we talk about the most <laughs> <laughs> it's obvious i would say that we're both introverts and so we really had to find something we knew we wanted to do a podcast for a lot of reasons as a creative outlet but we're like, what, what do we talk about? And so that's kind of how Carson played into that. We talk about him. We tell people about him all the time and tell stories about him. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, when we are envisioning what we wanted in a show, we wanted something happy, uplifting, family friendly. Carson with that cute face, he mm -hmm. just was a natural. Yeah. <laughs> <for> that. <laughs> And we had been mulling that idea for a couple of weeks. And then one morning, just in the twilight of waking up, I saw the logo just as like a graphic designer type person. It's actually our wedding colors yeah. uh, that are in the fonts. The photo of him in the logo is a picture I took at the vet because he likes going there. Uh, so he looked yeah. really happy. <laughs> and I just whipped it together and she came out. I'm like, well, here it is. Here's our show. And you went for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love your logo. And I think that picture or just Jack Russell's in general have such nice delineation yeah. of like that white to the brown to the dark. Mm. And so even his little pink tongue. Yeah. <laughs> all of it fits so well. Mm. He's like a graphic design all on his own. Yeah, if you yeah. look at the original dog emoji, the first generation of iPhones, we call Carson an emoji model because it looks like a Jack Russell. Oh, I see that. He's a logo onto himself. He's like, I don't need any yeah. drawing. Or anything. <laughs> yeah. like, I got you covered. <laughs> take yeah. my picture and we're good. I like, as you said, that it has the wedding colors too. That's a nice little added detail. Yeah. Since both of you are the co-hosts. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I tried to get my husband to be a co-host and he was like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> He'll come on for an occasional episode, but that's the extent of it. So that's really cool that you guys decided to do this together. Yeah. <laughs> on that subject, as you said, you wanted to start the podcast as a creative outlet. One, why podcast? As you said, if you don't enjoy talking all that much. and Because I agree with you. I'm also an introvert. <laughs> I, I agree as far as like podcasting, it can be... Something that's very extroverted, but seems manageable more so than like a YouTube channel or something like that. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's why I had such a hard time like actually jumping on the whole reels trends and yeah. things like that is because I'm like, I don't want to be doing that. <laughs> right. like, I'm like, I don't want to put my face out there in that way and because <laughs> it is more of an extroverted yeah. action than podcasts. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. So talk to me about the creativity in podcasting that you guys have enjoyed as creative people and why you decided to go into this podcast medium. I'm a children's book author, and I really wanted to build a podcast, build my platform, basically. That's why we began a lot of our interviews are authors of dog books. Yes, we thought it would be a good way to connect with people. And I think it's just, I, this is going to sound bad, because we learned a lot about podcasting before we did it, especially like sound quality and things like that. But I felt like it was an easy thing for us to do because we're natural storytellers. And so when we create an episode, we lay it out in such a way that it tells a story, right? It has a theme. Yeah. Maybe even our Insta dog kind of ties into whatever else we're talking about. So I think that's why I was drawn to podcasting. It's a way to tell story. And then I also think that you can see our creativity in that and also in the little details, like our theme music, our sound effects for our different segments. And what's really funny is that Becca writes children's books, but for the podcast, she's really into exploring the science and the psychology and all the dog behavior and training episodes. Yes. <laughs> Whereas I like the episodes of, you know, top 880 songs about Jack Russell Terriers or why every toddler <laughs> spirit animal is a JRT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are, those are the episodes that Gabriel writes. <laughs> and they're fun. They're mm. fun. They're just very different. Yeah. Of a variety of things. As I was saying earlier, it's just I think that is something you guys do so well as far as you're so creative with the ideas you can't come up with for your episodes. And as you said, like the 80s songs. <laughs> and it's just like I I love to be creative and I think I'm creative in certain ways. And then I see things that you guys are doing and I'm like, oh, dang, that's a good idea. Like that's out of the box. <laughs> and I think I think that's really, really cool. Oh, thank you. And then also what you were saying as far as the storytelling, Becca, I think that's a really interesting take on podcasting because you're right. It is it is a storytelling element. And that's something that my husband and I have gotten more into lately. Dog Zaddy for all the listeners, as I call him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just like we we recently did an episode of our experience in London with Lupin. And it was really like telling the story of our time there. Yeah. And it felt really cool to document this audio story yeah. for the future and just have it on file more so than the pictures on Instagram we took when right. we were there right. or whatever attempt at a blog post I attempted to do and <laughs> all of <Yeah>. that. <laughs> we're the same way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blog writing is hard when you really have to think about it and feel through it. And I was like, wow, I just spent 12 hours on you know, 300 words. Oh, Yeah. Yeah podcasting you get the same story out and it feels like it's an easier journey for people like us it is yeah yeah I, I completely agree I think it really is something to do with how not to be like all pick me with this but um but it has something to do with like how your brain works 
right yeah to a certain extent of like podcasting versus youtube versus you know any of these other creative outlets because i realized as i tried to write blog posts i very much was um was writing how i talk right and so it was all over the place i would like stop <laughs> mid-sentence and start something new and right <laughs> It doesn't translate as well, right? Exactly. <laughs> you want it to. Exactly. But... I'm like, do I sound like this when I'm talking? How do people even understand me? Because when you look <laughs> at it written, it's like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> I think the children's book aspect is really interesting. Have you written any children's books about Carson specifically then? Well, we have a picture book series that we uh -huh. self-published several years ago uh -huh. um, called Silly Kitty and Funny Honey. And it's about a Jack Russell and a cat mm -hmm. who are best friends. So those are just the, the stories that we've written about him. I haven't written anything including him recently. Oh, that's cool. I think that's so interesting way to what I was saying earlier about like memorializing yeah. our london episode it like memorializing you know wiggles and carson a little mm. bit in this in this children's book i think that's that's a really interesting route to take and I, yeah i look forward to you know if you ever come out with any that are published or anything let me know i will definitely yeah, i know it's a children's book but i will totally still read it <laughs> <laughs> i'll send you the link i have i have a, a published book i'll send it to you okay cool thank you on that mode of creativity, we were kind of talking earlier about Carson's favorite toys, and you mentioned the Franken toy, <laughs> where you like put together all of the pieces of his other toys. Yeah, that is so creative. <laughs> and I, I was just thinking, I was like, I would have never thought to do that. And it just goes back to your guys' thinking outside of the box. So, do you think that your creativity that you do both in your careers and that you just have does that influence your dog parenting at all i think so i feel like we have to we have to be creative in order to keep up with him <laughs> we do right? yeah i feel like he's a part creator of that game the franken toy mm -hmm. game he is because he will literally bring you two toys that yeah. he wants you to put together yeah and sometimes you show him hey look they don't go like <laughs> i can't there's nothing to tie there's a ball and <laughs> i you can't know. tie these two tennis balls together so go and get so, some more pieces yeah we're like go get another part like go get some and he will bring something different wow it's amazing it's really amazing <laughs> Oh my gosh, that's really unique. Yeah, that he does that. It sounds like he fits so well. He does into the family. Like you guys all feed each other's creativity. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And and as we said, now that he's starting to slow down, we've been very intentional about incorporating the things that we've learned doing podcasting, yeah. the training tips and that we hear on your show and with our guest, Susan Light from Doggy Dojo, mm -hmm. incorporating those and, and helping him mature faster, hopefully, mm -hmm. in terms of his attitude <laughs> and, <laughs> and his obedience, because, yeah, he knows a lot of tricks. One of his favorite places to go is the pet store. And I was trying to keep him busy while Becca was in line. And I was just going through all of his tricks. And then we get applause from the people in line. I didn't even realize they were watching. I was just trying to keep him from going nuts, you know. <laughs> keep him uh, focused. And I was like, wow, yeah, he does know a lot of tricks. And there's a lot of things that we can do. And eventually we'll be able to get to the point where we can start telling stories with him. <laughs> yeah, that would be so cool. A couple of the guests that I've had on before, like Chrissy Joy and Amber Carr, they've done that with their dogs. And as far as like trying to do the movies and commercials and stuff. And I, yeah. I think there is such a creative element to that. And you need the right dog and the right dog parent mm -hmm. to go for it in that way. And so I always say I cannot. <laughs> One, because my dogs would, <laughs> would have no interest. <laughs> and, and two, it's how you can get so creative with tricks yeah. like that amazes yeah. me. The different things that I've seen on your guys' Instagram that Carson is able to do, the different tricks and the things that people come up with to have their dogs do. Yeah. <laughs> Just earlier, like when you asked what the best trick is, and I'm like, he goes in between my legs. He's middle. He sits. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, Carson can't do that. So, he can't uh, do middle, yeah. <laughs> he could probably pick it up very quickly, though, mm -hmm. which is very impressive. So, yeah, I like that. I like that creativity. It sounds like you guys all just really feed on each other with yeah. the with the podcast, with yeah. tricks, with toys, and and Carson is part of that, which is really cool. Yeah. Speaking on the podcast, you guys are coming up on your hundredth episode. Mm -hmm. 
and a full year of podcasting. How do you feel about that? How has that journey been? It's really been amazing. I feel lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I feel a bit tired, yes. to, be, to be truthful, <laughs> mm -hmm. hence the need for the margin we were talking about earlier. But I also feel a great sense of triumph. I mm -hmm. mean, we did 100 episodes in one mm -hmm. year, and that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and to be able to, like you've already said, but think of all these different topics and just really learn as we go. It was exciting. It's, it's been fun. Yeah. And as artistic people, you want to have an audience because you want to share what you've created and, and you want people to be touched with, you know, what yeah. touches you. And out of everything that we've done before, the writing, theater, short films, the audience that we've been able to reach through podcasting is enormous by comparison. And so yeah. it's been it's been really nice. I love that response. As you said, it's it can be very taxing sometimes. And you're like, I need space from this. <laughs> but then also it's such an integral part of yourself yeah. that you put into it. And as you said, Gabe, like the artistic aspect and, and creativity that you put into it. And then it resonates with people. And then that makes you want to keep going. Like it's a part of me. Yeah. Right. At this point, especially now that you guys have been doing it for this full year. Right. Have there been any moments of learning or missteps or anything like that? Well, I came from a marketing type background, but I had no idea how much I didn't know about sound design. You know, just being a part of the podcasting community, the online dog community, uh, we still feel very new in all of those aspects. Most mm -hmm. podcasts burn out, you know, before they hit seven. So at times we were like, I don't know if we're going to make it to 10 because it takes so many hours to edit and write new episodes and find people to join you as interviewees. It has been challenging. It's been very yeah. rewarding, but it's been as exhausting as much as it's been rewarding. Yes. And I think we've learned that there are certain idiosyncrasies that each of us have that, <laughs> you know, we love each other on the podcast. But on occasion, you know, we're creating this thing together and I'm like, stop doing that. It's not, you know, <laughs> not, or he's like, speak up. You're lowering your voice. You drop off and I got to fix that. Yes. <laughs> like, uh -huh. So we learn to work with each other or, or work through it anyway. I'll say that. So yeah, <laughs> I completely agree. Yes, I could could not understand that more. <laughs> it was the exact same thing with Izzy and I, because I would do the editing. Mm. She would like cough or something and then pick back up. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm probably going to take that cough out. So like you got to start two words back. Yeah. Do those occasional episodes with Mike and, and <laughs> I'll be like, why are you doing that? You're going on a tangent and he'll do the same to me. I'm like, right. this is my podcast. And he's like, yeah, you're not as funny as you think you are. Oh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> He's like, it's not a good joke. Move on. <laughs> well, I'm like, okay, okay. We need that honesty, right? And yes. Absolutely. <laughs> better to get it from than your spouse. <laughs> yes. Yeah, the idiosyncrasies, as you were saying, is sometimes it's really hard to, as you said, Gabe, to like, one, overcome those learning curves. Right. Yeah. I'm not overly techie person. And learning to edit has been the bane of my existence. But now yeah, yeah. I'm so addicted to it. I'm like, I can't not edit the podcast because I'm like, now I have it so dialed in that I'm like, I don't like it how other people do it or whatever. <laughs> and so, and it's actually, I feel like sometimes to my detriment because I'll listen to a podcast, not a dog one, just like any podcast. And I'm like, oh, they could have taken that out. I don't know why they didn't. I'm like, yeah. oh, those S's are really sharp. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh my God, that's my issue. I cannot figure out how to fix my S's. But, but it's, all the listeners are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> all that effort you put in editing, it really shows. It's easy to listen to. You know, it is. Oh, thank you. And you also, Carly, do such an incredible job of interviewing. Mm -hmm. So you reflect back and check understanding. I mean, my goodness. I'll just, I'll take some lessons from you. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you guys so much. That's so sweet. And I think as you, you were saying, we, we can all learn from each other. I'd love to dip my toe into being a little bit more creative with my episodes like you guys do. So it's all interesting how everyone's different brains work. But thank you for saying that, Gabe, about the editing, because yeah, it was a hurdle to say the least. And it still is constantly, but getting through it. I think it's really hard 
with podcasting and tell me if you agree, but as you're talking, you're also at the same time thinking, is this entertaining or is this making sense? Yes, absolutely. I don't think I usually would think along those lines, you know, if I'm just talking to a friend. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's sometimes, it's sometimes very mentally taxing to jump through those hoops in your mind as you're trying to verbalize something. Yeah. And then you're like, I need to go take a rest now. Oh, yeah. A nap is in order. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and I think that's where that whole introvert part comes in. Oh, my gosh, guys. Well, I think I think that was all of my questions for you. And thank you for jumping through all those hoops and, and fielding all these questions. We had a great uh, multiverse interview, I think. Yeah, we absolutely. Sure did. It was a blast. Thank you. Yeah. Well, as I said, Anytime, anytime you have anything with Carson, if a book comes out, any of that, I'd love to hear it. You guys are so creative with your podcast and it's it's really enjoyable to listen and follow along your journey. Thank you. Thank you. So if people want to follow you, where can they find you? Yeah, so they can find us on our website at jackrussellparents.com. And we are on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at JRT Podcast. And you can listen to our podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. Perfect. Yay. All right, everyone, if you want to follow the With a Dog Podcast, it's at With a Dog Podcast on Instagram and Facebook and With a Dog Pod on TikTok. And there's new episodes every Wednesday. And your guys' comes out twice a week. Mondays and Thursdays, yes. Mondays and Thursdays. Okay. So we're covered, basically. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I guess we'll sign off now. Head back into our own little universes. Thank you, guys. Well, that does it, puppy parents. That is a wrap on our 100th episode. What? what? It's crazy. 100 episodes. Yes. Oh, dip. <laughs> Stop it. Yes, 100 episodes. And one year today that we officially launched Jack Russell Parents Podcast. One year today? Yeah. Oh, dip. <laughs> Stop it. Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Puppy Parents, for coming with us on this wild adventure. We could not have made it without you. We can't wait to see what is in store for the future. We will see you and your adorable pups in the next realm. Eleven-year-old Walter just may die of boredom doing the most boring summer ever. While exploring an abandoned garden, Walter discovers a mystical elf world where all dead plants spring to life at his touch. The downtrodden elves think Walter is there to save them with his new life-giving powers. To defeat the wicked Ichabod von Schnatho before he sucks everyone's joy dry with his never-ending list of rules. Walter will need to use his best power yet, his imagination. In a dying, oppressed world, one boy has the power to bring freedom and life. Walter Plume and the Dehydrated Imagination will take you and your middle grade reader on a thrilling journey while igniting the depths of your imagination. Boys the Book says, beautiful imagery leads to spectacular world building in this fantasy that will leave the young reader glued to the pages. Relatable characters add to the magic of the story with never a dull moment. Get your magical fingers on a copy of Walter Plume and the Dehydrated Imagination by Rebecca Lynn Morales, now at Amazon.com. Find out more at WalterPlume.com. Let Walter and his story awaken your beautiful and creative imagination. Did you enjoy this episode? Did you learn from the content? Or did you just have a good, relatable laugh? Well, now what? It's time to subscribe, follow, keep listening, and give a positive review on the Apple Podcast app. 
Then share the podcast with other puppy parents. This will allow us to connect you and your friends with fun, dog-loving content week after week. Until next time, this is Becca and Gabe, the Jack Russell parents. Say bye, Carson. (laughs) We'd love to connect with you online at jackrussellparents.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at JRT Podcasts. That's at JRT for Jack Russell Terrier Podcast. The Jack Russell Parents Podcast is produced by Earball Audio. Jack Russell Parents is brought to you in part by Super Chewer. From the makers of BarkBox, Super Chewer is a themed monthly delivery of toys and treats made especially for dogs who play harder and demand a challenge. Simply go to jackrussellparents.com and click the Super Chewer link to enjoy their great offers while also supporting our podcast. Mm-hmm.